The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the traditional Catholic faith and religion as professed and practiced by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of the Second Vatican Council and the so-called New Order of Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How art thou? Very fine. I'm good. Thank you. How are oh, you doing? Good, good. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight, Father. Oh, sir. Father, there is a new film set to be released uh, next Friday, the 12th of October. Actually, it's titled Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer. There's been a lot of controversy surrounding this film, Father. So any, any comments on that? Well, the controversy is probably yet to come, the biggest controversy. Um, I did have a pre-screening of the film. I was invited to one. I was very grateful for that. Uh, I wasn't really curious about it when it was announced because it was going to be crowdfunded. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I really didn't know. I, I knew about the story of Gosnell. I actually followed it rather closely, insofar as it could be followed, because the press wasn't really giving it much information, weren't getting much information from the press. Um, but uh, for those who don't know, uh, this uh, Kermit Gosnell, MD, was a, uh, an abortion provider, as they call him, in Philadelphia. And he'd operated for, for 30 years there. And uh, the health department in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania had not only pretty much ignored his operation, but were actually told, allegedly by the governor there, who was a Nova Soro Catholic, to leave him alone and just not to stay away from there, you know, not to interfere. Well, the conditions in the uh, abortion, I can't call it a clinic, it was actually an execution chamber, uh, were just the most outrageous and atrocious uh, they were filthy, uh, sickeningly so. And um, not only did uh, thousands of babies die there, but uh, mothers were at risk, and there, there were actually deaths there. Uh, this all came to light uh, according to the, the movie, which follows very closely the history of the case, uh, in the course of a, a drug bust, where uh, drugs were being... Uh, dispensed uh, by unauthorized people at the clinic, so-called, and uh, drugs were, were being used very freely and uh, irresponsibly and you know, even contrary to law. And this began a kind of um, domino effect uh, investigation, which finally led to a court trial in which this Dr. Gosnell was accused of uh, first-degree murder on a number of counts, for uh, actually murdering babies who had been born alive. How many babies in the course of those years had been born alive, we really don't know. I understand that uh, uh, three, uh, only on three cases was the doctor uh, found guilty of, of actually murdering the babies by taking a scissors and snipping the spinal column of the baby, snipping the neck of the baby to kill it. <clears throat> and um, it's, it's a very compelling story. It's a very compelling film. And uh, you know, the, the officials who didn't want to prosecute this case, uh, those who did and uh, the aftermath all basically harped on the, 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 the sense, this is not about abortion. Abortion is legal. It is not murder. And so on. that's OK. No, just keep abortion out of this. This is the fact that babies are born alive and the doctor killed them. It has nothing to do with abortion, right? We all know that. Wink, wink. It has nothing to do with abortion, right? But it really does. I mean, when you're watching the film, it really does. I think it's a very powerful film. I expected it to be very, very amateurish because it was crowdfunded, uh, which means they went through one of these sites on the internet that uh, like raises funds from the people out, out there and want to contribute toward the, the cause. And they set a goal of 2.1 million. And uh, curiously enough, within two weeks, they had their 2.1 million. They finally raised uh, 2.3 million, I understand. 
And I thought, when I was invited to the film and said, yes, I'd, I'd really like to go, I thought that the film would be very amateurish. Um, it wasn't. It was very, very professionally done, uh, very powerfully done, very, it's a very compelling story. And I thought that um, the actors and actresses in the film, every, every single one of them did a, a tremendous job. Of, I mean, the good guys and the bad guys. One of the directors actually uh, uh, was the uh, defense attorney for this doctor who'd killed the babies. And he was, well, that d attorney was so perfectly despicable <laughs> in the way he went about defending what Gosnell had done um, that, you know, you couldn't help but come away thinking, oh, you awful, what an awful person. He was one of the directors of the film. <clears throat> so he was one of the main motive forces behind it that made the stories some um, compelling. So you got to give him a lot of credit for that. Um, <clears throat> that actor's name was, um, let's see, what does it say here? Gives his name here, uh, Circe, right? Nick Circe. In fact, uh, I gather that people in the world would recognize many of the names here because these are actually contemporary actors who've acted in, in some more or less decent films or programs. And, uh, but they all did a fantastic job. And um, I do have to warn about the film, though, okay? Uh, they don't... <laughs> the fact that they're not traditional Catholics shows. The um, the movie opens with someone rushing to a wedding. I won't tell the story. I'll just point it out that uh, the bride's the bridal dress is very immodest. Okay, not the type of thing we would allow in any church at any time. Okay, but I mean it reflects the modern sense of turning the wedding into a burlesque show, and and, and having no respect for the fact that it. You know, our Lord is there, or having no respect for the people, because it, you know, the, the immodesty. But their sense of modesty is not, you know, what it is. I mean, we're looking. We're looking at a Novus Ordo wedding. Is what we're looking at, basically. So that tells you. That tells you something. And so, um, the movie starts with that scene, and it's somewhat distressing, because you're not expecting it. And you're wondering, what does this have to do with anything? And as the movie progresses and leaves that behind rather quickly, uh, you realize it really had nothing to do with anything. They didn't have to have that. But um, in any case, once one get, gets past that, the story unfolds. Um, quickly that is forgotten as you get into the story of what actually happened. And the, the film actually does re, uh, recreate the scenes of the crime very well. Um, you really get a sense of what was going on in that abortion clinic. Uh, so uh, the other thing that concerns me, of course, is the language. Again, they didn't have to throw that language in there. I would say, though, that the bad language is used by the bad guys. So you could get the idea, OK, bad people talk like that and blaspheme. You know, It's not every minute, but it's sprinkled throughout the film somewhat. And, uh, you know, I find myself, when I hear the name of God or Jesus taken in vain, saying, oh, Lord, have mercy on us, or, you know, some, blessed be the name of God, blessed be his holy name, you know, and, uh, whatever, and in response to that, and try to turn it into an opportunity for a prayer. But um, I would say that uh, for grown-ups, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anybody but a grown-up to see the film, okay? that these things would not be an occasion of sin. Um, and I wouldn't recommend, as I say, anybody who's not an adult seeing the film. Sure. Um, a mature, let's say, 11th and 12th grader might actually uh, benefit from it in the sense that when I say mature, that they, they, they're not going to focus on immodesty and they're not going to be impressed by the, the, you know, any blasphemy they hear. They'll react as you or I would, by making an act of reparation to our Lord 
and adoration of his holy name. But the story, I think, could really um, impress upon uh, um, a young adult the evil of abortion and how this must be resisted with every fiber of our being. We have to resist it. It's satanic. And this is the message I think that comes through, that this, this is truly pathological. <clears throat> um, abortion itself is pathological. What I would point out, uh, finally, about, about the story of Kermit Gosnell, by the way, he was found guilty and is now serving a life sentence without parole, uh, is that what is depicted here in this abortion clinic, which operated with no control uh, for all those years and victimized, of course, thousands of babies, and, and mothers, and, and so many others, too, who are associated, the nurses and everyone who's associated with it. It's a, it's a true horror story. But it has, it's, it's like a, a, a horror story more horrible than any mere story, because it's real. And you know as it's happening, this was real. This is not just the product of somebody's imagination. This is real here. This really happened. And, um, but I would want anybody coming away from this film, Tom, to realize that this was not an exception. I mean, Kermit Gosnell, Gosnell's abortion clinic was not an exception. It is the rule. This is what is done in every single abortion, abortuary in the country, in the world. This is the reality of it. Kermit Gosnell had to be prosecuted because he violated almost the omerta of the abortion industry. Don't let people see the blood and gore. When people entered his facility, so-called, I mean, they saw abortion in all of its horror. In other abortion clinics, so I, I, I don't like the word clinic because it's, it's, it's in, other, in other abortion chambers and there, so just, they hide the blood and gore as much as they can, so you don't see it. <clears throat> they sanitize it, so you don't see the reality of abortion. Kermit Gosnell's great crime, really, was that he let it get out, what abortion is really all about. But if you walk into an abortion facility, and you see nice, sparkling, clean walls, and sparkling, clean floors, and nice, clean sheets, and you see all of that, uh, you don't see any of what they saw everywhere in Kermit Gosnell's uh, horror chamber there, House of Horrors. So it really was a House of Horrors. Um, at least that's the honest truth about abortion. Those clean walls, those clean sheets and all that, they cover up the reality. They're flushing the blood, they're flushing the... E even Gosnell's, even Gosnell's uh, House of Horrors would not have come to light, perhaps, if he hadn't had a dispute with his uh, disposal facility, <laughs> his disposal uh, company that took the bodies and disposed them. So there he is running them down the garbage disposal. Right? He's putting them in jars, uh, their feet, and, and storing them in the, in the refrigerator. <clears throat> if these things hadn't been there, if they'd all been carted away, then he might have been cited with the health department, by the health department, and just moved on. He might still be doing this today. But I want people to understand that what Gosnell was doing is what they're all doing. It's just that the rest of them are better at cleaning up the mess. They're better at cleaner, cleaning up the scene of the crime. That's, that's, a, that's a great point to make. Father, you know, with this whole, uh, this whole abortion crime, it, it seems that uh, it's one giant euphemism that they try and implore. There's this movement going on now, this shout your abortion mm -hmm. uh, thing, thing that they're talking about. And it's... Um, yeah. It's, it's all along those same lines of just trying to create this facade and, and try and hide what it really is. Like you said, hide all the blood and guts and gore and everything, and instead, shout your abortion. Make it something proud, happy, mm. joyous occasion. And it's just such a euphemism. It's such a lie. Mm. And that tells you that it comes from the devil. Well, they're monsters. They're monsters. They have to be monsters, right? Mm. And... Um, the ones who lie to themselves and tell themselves, this is not a human being that we're killing here. This is not a human life we're taking. <clears throat> Maybe they're, they've given into the euphemism 
and maybe they've convinced themselves to believe it, that they're not killing a human being. But they, they are, that's still evil, but they're not quite as evil as those who are pro-choice, who acknowledge that it's a human life, but still will defend your right to kill the child, right? There was something on LifeSite News, actually, a, a video of a, some, I guess it's a man, something resembling, he has facial hair anyway, did you see it? Yes. Where he, he, he swings around and kicks the phone out of the hand of a young lady who's pro-life, right? He's having a discussion, so-called a discussion with her. And he swings around and kicks that out of her hand. And, um, and he's been tracked down, identified, fired mm -hmm. from the salon and hair salon in which he worked. But he says he will not apologize for defending the, the rights of, of choice of women. And he will not even apologize to a woman for standing up for the rights of women to choose. Okay? Well, you know, the fact is we, we know the pro-choicers are the ones who say, okay, I'm not in favor of abortion itself because, I mean, I realize that that's the human life you're taking. They kind of concede that point. But I, I do f defend the right of people, the choice that women have to murder their babies. I will defend their right to murder the babies. And that is the most monstrous of all. That is what the Novus Ordo Catholics, so-called Novus Ordo Catholics, are doing. That's why they hide behind the pro-choice label. They're the worst monsters of all. And you know what? <clears throat> They're acting perfectly in accord with the last Vatican II document on religious liberty, Right? <clears throat> which says that as long as they're following their conscience, nobody can interfere, except the state to, <clears throat> to impose uh, order. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the state, as it is, is imposing order by, keep, by keeping the, the pro-life people uh, under wraps. Right? Uh, that's how they import, the state imposes order. But again, I mean, if you read the document on religious liberty Vatican II, you see that this is exactly what is forecast and already, uh, let's say, pre-approved by Vatican II. And I challenge anybody to prove it's not. Right. So anyway, but there's so much, so much for Gosnell. The movie is called Gosnell, The Trial of America's Biggest Serial Killer. Killer. I think it's based on a book by one of the uh, producers, Anne McElhinney. And her book is Gosnell, The Trial of America's Most Prolific serial killer. So, uh, but it's, it's not for the faint of heart because neither the book nor the movie because the reality that they're portraying is not for the faint of heart. <clears throat> um, but I'll tell you, it, it sure will uh, motivate. I, I, anybody who has any heart at all will be motivated by this. Sure. No doubt about it. Okay. Well, Father, if we could, let's try and get to a couple emails. Uh, possible. By the way, if I can just say sure. this. The movie is coming out uh, in theaters. I understand they were trying to get it in 600 theaters, at least, because then it would have a much wider distribution from that point. That's like a break point, I guess. And I, I understand now that they've got it in 750 theaters. Good. But uh, if the pro-life people wanted to, if they see the movie and they want to really make sure that it is seen, then they could call theaters that are not showing it and call them and say, look, we, we, we want you to show this. Okay. So there's a way to, uh, to promote this, this effort. Um, as I say, I can't, I can't um, recommend it without reservations, right? But I think to the right people, uh, it, could, it could help uh, motivate them and maybe even prevent an abortion. Even if it prevented one abortion, it'd be worth the $2.3 million <laughs> and all the effort that went into it. Sure. Definitely. All right, well, Father, let's uh, switch gears here and get into these emails. This first one is from a viewer who says, I recall a while back that you solicited proposals to name the non-dogmatic position of the Society of St. Pius V regarding the present state of the chair of Peter. I propose sede dubitism to suggest the objective positive doubt that exists about the Catholicity of the Pope of the Novus Ordo without connoting any claim to the authority to dogmatically depose him. What do you think? I think that could work. Sede dubitism, right? There's a principle, which is a Catholic principle. I mean, it's acknowledged 
uh, by Catholic theologians with uh, <clears throat> at least the tacit approval of the Holy See, and that is Papa Dubius, Papa Nullus. Uh, a doubtful pope is no, no pope at all, practically speaking. A uh, pope whose papacy is in doubt, <clears throat> in the practical order, is not a pope. Um, even if the doubt were later resolved in favor of his having been the pope all the time, okay, uh, the fact is, as long as his papacy is in doubt, the authority, uh, his authority as pope is in doubt, and no one is obliged to follow a doubtful authority, right? Um, and that's what it means, uh, that in the practical order, a pope who is claimed to the papacy is, is, is objectively doubtful, uh, has no claim to the obedience of the Catholic people, until it is clear that he is truly the Supreme Pontiff, Vicar of Christ on Earth, and has the authority to command them. So, uh, that would definitely be the least we could say about Francis right now. Uh, the very least, as I say. Um, applying the principle of the Church, which, as I say, Tom, it's well known. I mean, it's, uh, there are certain lay people who uh, try to comment on it and, and fail to really understand it and apply it. They're, they're, they're urging, I would say they're partisan, in trying to merge one side or the other, one conclusion. But the fact is that uh, the principle, a doubtful pope is not a pope at all, uh, is no pope. Uh, understood correctly, uh, has been basically uh, brought on in the church as a very Catholic principle. And something that we can follow, and even should follow. The principle, by the way, became extremely important in application during the time of the Great Western Schism, uh, when the papacy had returned to Rome from Avignon in the late 1300s. And uh, th thanks to the, the urgency, the, the agency, if I say, of uh, St. Catherine of Siena, and uh, Pope Urban VI was elected, the French cardinals who elected him then rejected him and went on to elect someone else in Avignon. Um, and then uh, years later to try to uh, bring about a unity uh, because of the confusion that was reigning between Avignon and Rome. Um, at Pisa they tried to elect a third and uh, so now they had three claimants to the papal throne. Obviously all three of them couldn't possibly have been the Pope. Uh, it was possible that none of them were validly Pope. As it turns out, the Church judged this, that Urban VI and his successors were truly the valid, valid Popes, that the, uh, the claimants in Avignon and the later claimants in Pisa were not. But the confusion was so great that the Church doesn't consider the non-Popes to have been anti-Popes, doesn't denounce them as anti-Popes. <clears throat> After all, it was the Cardinals who created that mess. And um, she doesn't uh, consider those who followed the wrong person as being culpable. I mean, after all, there were saints who, who were actually following, St. Fra Fra uh, uh, Vincent Ferrer among them, who was actually following the false Pope in Avignon. One thing about all of these men is they kept the same faith, they kept the same worship, they, they adhered to Catholic tradition, and that was the key that kept them all Catholic at that time. They were all adhering to Catholic tradition. The problem was a question of fact. <clears throat> and as long as it was uh, um, uh, confusing, uh, it was also, you might say, excusing culpability. God brought things together through the agency of the Council of Constance, uh, which was a unique event in the history of the Church. People should study that. Uh, how God rescued the church from that seemingly impossible situation. But he did. And we should remember that today. The church seems to be in this, it's a seemingly impossible situation. But God has already intervened and rescued the church in rather ex extraordinary ways, you know, you, that no one else could really envision, you know. But that's God saving his church. So, um, in any case, uh, with regard... Uh, to the matter of uh, Francis right now, uh, the very least one can say that uh, 
it is doubtful that he is truly uh, the Roman Catholic pontiff, uh, supreme pontiff of the Catholic Church, and uh, vicar of Christ on earth. He certainly doesn't act like it, to say the least. And uh, that, therefore, according to the principle that the Church herself has given to us, uh, because of the doubtfulness of the, his papacy and his authority, we do not have the obligation to obey him. Okay. In fact, we can see readily there's uh, the obligation not to obey him, right. and the damage that he's trying to do. All right. Uh, well, Father, that's Sede Dubitism. What do you think of the theological position of Sede Privationism, which holds that the Novus Ordo Popes hold the office of the papacy materially, but not formally? Well, I think that's a rehash of what was known as the thesis of Kasikiakum for a while. This was already being noised about when I was, uh, back in the day as I was ordained uh, at Econ in 1978, the thesis of Kasikiakum. I think that was first voiced by um, the Dominican uh, Père um, Gerard de Laurier, who sadly later on went on to become a Took bishop. Um, I, I always thought this was very bizarre. The idea of saying that one could be materially the Pope, but formally not, doesn't make any sense. I mean, to me, it makes no sense whatsoever. That principle of, of uh, say, say privationism, is that what they're calling it? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> basically, that someone who um, goes through the process and is elected by cardinals, Right? Um, and accepts, accepts the election of the papacy, that uh, if he is not a Catholic, does not have the faith, that he's just there basically holding the seat, he's holding the place, um, but he has no authority. But the, the very formal cause of, the, pap of, of the, the office of the papacy is that authority. And uh, the material cause of itself is, is nothing without that. So by no means can a man be considered the Pope unless he actually holds the office. And if he holds the office, it's more than just keeping the seat warm. He's holding the office. The office is more than the seat. I think these people are confusing the office of the papacy with the actual seat in which the, you know, the, the see of Peter, as it's called. <laughs> and... Um, I mean, to me, this is tantamount to saying, well, look, if you had a, if you had a, a royal banquet, okay, <coughs> and um, all the places were taken at the table, but the king had not yet arrived, and his seat was vacant. So the jester goes up and sits down in his seat, says, well, I guess I'll sit here until the king arrives, so here I am, you know. And for the time being, materially, I'm the king, aren't I, right? But, you know, formally, of course, they don't have the authority of the king. But how could he even be considered a materiality of the king? I mean, they'd, they'd run him out of there, you know, um, as, a, as, as a usurper. I mean, this is making a mockery of the, of the king's throne for, for something like that to sit there, which is what a jester does. I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a mocker, obviously. But I think he'd lose his head if he tried that, pointy hat and all. So... Um, no, the, the whole idea, to me, just doesn't compute whatsoever in, in the terms of the Roman Catholic faith, the Roman Catholic concept of Catholicism. <clears throat> I see Francis as the greatest enemy of the papacy in the history of the Church because he is not only making a mockery of the papacy, he is hell-bent on destroying the very concept of the papacy. But I'm afraid this sede privationism is another example of the contortions people have to go through, the mental gymnastics they're trying to go through to explain, to explain uh, the situation today. And I think they're also in the process of destroying the very concept, the very Catholic notion of the papacy. So no, I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, thesis or this uh, idea of sede privationism has anything Catholic about it whatsoever. Okay. Father, if we could get to one more email really quickly. Uh, this viewer writes in and asks, what is the traditional Catholic understanding 
or interpretation of the creation story found in the book of Genesis. He says that today many Novus Ordo Catholics and secularists completely disregard the creation story as a legitimate account of the creation of the world, and they regard it as myth and non-scientific. So, Father, what is a traditional Catholic understanding of the creation story? How long do we have? A few minutes. Okay. Define a few minutes in biblical time. <laughs> in biblical time. Um, the, the Catholic understanding, the true Catholic understanding of the creation story is that God created. And that he created successively over what are called days. The days are not to be taken as 24 hours spinning of the earth on its axis relative to the sun. Because the days were being counted even before. Mm -hmm. You had the earth's axis spinning relative to the sun. Okay, in the, in, the, in the account of creation. So the church has never said that we're counting this as 24 hours as a literal day, right? In the sense that you and I clock the time of day. A very limited understanding of what a day is. Not limited in sacred scripture. But uh, the fact is that God created out of nothing by the power of his divine will decreeing things into existence. And he created them successfully and in a certain order and that he created a man, Adam by drawing him out of the slime of the earth to form his body and then created his soul and infused that soul into the body to make man a living being Okay, and man is body and soul as we defined him in the catechism Right? he's a creature composed of body and soul but he's also created in the image and likeness of God and that image of God is in his nature, as I've mentioned before, of intellect and will, to know truth, to love goodness, to enjoy beauty, what is beautiful, as God himself. But in a, in a very, in a finite way, of course, in a limited way, in a creature's way. And, um, but man represents God on earth by nature, but also... Uh, in his likeness by grace, by sanctifying grace, as he created Adam in sanctifying grace, and Eve as well. And so that is the essence of the account of creation in uh, maybe uh, 500 words or less, <laughs> and in the few minutes. Um, if, if the questioner is asking about uh, what's, you know, the question of evolution and all the rest, well, that's, that is not accounted for in the scripture, obviously, okay? This is an, uh, uh, an adjunct as a scientific theory, which they like to prove. Um, as Pope Pius XII said, humanum uh, genis, uh, genus, or humani generis, excuse me, humani generis in 1950, um, physical evolution is one thing, you know? That's a, scientifically, it's a theory that can be examined scientifically, tested, if it can be tested at all, uh, proven or disproven. It's a matter of science. Uh, spiritually, no. He says that's completely off the table. You cannot accept that. Uh, the creation of the soul directly by God uh, and the qualities of the soul as God creates it, that is a matter of faith. That That, that is not something science has anything to say about. And, of course, um, we know that uh, the atheists are trying, to, basically, it comes down to that, the atheists are trying to use their uh, hypothesis of, of evolution uh, to support their materialistic idea of, you know, that there is no God. I mean, this is what, uh, this is what Darwin's bulldog Thomas Huxley said Darwin's great contribution was to prove that God was not necessary, right? This is what it's really all about, let's face it. This is what they're really invested in it for. If that, uh, those, uh, those who are actual scientists, really, and who conduct things in a very scientific way, can tell you that the very idea of physical evolution is preposterous. It contains so many... Uh, scientific um, conundrums that, that, that just are unsolvable, really, that it becomes a, a matter of 
pure faith, I'm sure a scientist even believe that it's possible. So, um, in any case, I, I, I thought that they might be kind of hinting in that direction that this is what they're I've got in the back of their minds. So I thought I would just kind of throw that in sure. because I, let's say, it's a matter of principle. I can't answer anything in just a few, <laughs> just a few minutes. That was pretty good. Five. I think that was about five, five minutes. So well, not, well, thank not, you. not bad. Well, thank you. well, finally, what's in there? I know you've got a busy schedule for tonight. So thank you for your time. Thank you for Very being welcome, here. Tom. Well, thank you. God no bless problem. you. Yeah. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.